Hello and welcome to episode 22 of Dial H for Hero Clicks. I'm your host, Hunter Smith. With me today is Just Austin. We decided to kill Drew off by request. Let's just let's send him on a sabbatical this time. We don't have to go all out no, no, no. killing him every time he's gone. We The world needs to know that because he called Scott out for cheating. It's true. We did have a special request from Scott that we killed Drew. It is true, and that's why he's dead this week. I, I don't know. I guess you weren't in on that. But. We're recording a couple days late. I was a uh, best man in a wedding in Kentucky this weekend. And uh, it was a pretty eventful weekend. Actually, I don't even think I told you all that happened. So, uh, Ashley and I were the best man and the maid of honor. I thought you were going to say you were and the best man. <laughs> we, we ended up doing the about 95% of the work of the entire wedding. Because they were ill-prepared and knowing Jeremy, it, that's just how it is. So, uh, anyways, I was in charge of the reception. Did it all myself. The prep, the put every table and chair out, did all the decorations by hand. Like, Ashley, Ashley showed me how to do it. I spent all day cooking, getting it set up. The whole time everybody was at the reception, I was just cooking and cleaning. Well, there was a keg, and oh, Jeremy and I had brought ten cases of beer and some hard liquor and stuff, too. And there weren't really that many people there to be drinking all this alcohol, so the people that were there were just totally shit-faced. And there was a guy who came with the DJ uh, the, um, who was drunk and probably high on something else, honestly, <laughs> the way he was acting. Well, I wasn't there at the time, that it ha- the first time it happened, but apparently he was causing some trouble, just typical drunk, annoying, you know, butthole trouble. Oh, of course. With, with a couple of guys, but nothing major. Then I come back and I get told about it and and I'm so I, I like I'm keeping an eye on him. But I'm just still going about my business. Well apparently a few minutes later he said something a little unnecessary and racist to a black guy who happens to be a very close friend and a, a relative of Jeremy's. Oh no. And um all hell broke loose. I Tried to run around the outside of the building and catch up before the fight happened. I did succeed in that. However, I basically like came through the door right in the middle of the fight, like <laughs> dodging punches. So I was like, everybody calm down. If the cops get called, anybody who's been drinking and fighting instantly gets arrested. That's how they do it down there. So I was like, I haven't been drinking that much, and I'm always looking for an excuse to beat somebody's ass. I was like, let me, let me do the fighting and let me do the kicking out. Everybody chill the hell out. So I grab the dude by the shirt, ask him to leave. He doesn't give me much argument. He's like, okay, dude, okay, okay, okay. So he leaves. He's wasted, though. He can't just drive home. Yeah. So he goes and sits in the DJ people's van, right? So fast forward about an hour. The dude's still sitting in the van. He's cool. That problem's resolved, right? As I said, everybody is plastered. Um, the br- uh, One of the relatives of the bride and his fiance have a, an altercation, an argument, in the middle of the dance floor, and she slaps the ever-loving piss out of him. <laughs> like, I'm talking, this is the biggest slap I've ever seen in my life. His face was immediately bruised, like a big black purple handprint on his face. Damn, son. So, within the bride's family, who are kind of white trash, within her family, there's this giant fight. <laughs> like, and I'm not talking argument. I'm talking fight. <laughs> and... Like, punches are about to be thrown between the mom and the dad. Like the mom and the dad are fighting. And the bride, who's kind of drunk herself, kind of, like, jumps in the middle of it. Like, this is my wedding. You guys are acting stupid. You know, blah, blah, blah. She almost gets hit. Like, at one point, I'm holding the bride in one arm and, like, pulling her away from punches being thrown. <laughs> I kick her dad in the stomach and, like, kick him back and push him back from everything that's going on. I'm like, you guys. I was like, that's it. Party's over. Everybody leave. And I just start throwing people out. So... When the whole fight goes down, the DJs are like, fuck it, we're getting out of here. (laughs) So they start packing up their stuff. But when they start packing up their stuff, the dude who was sitting in the van comes in and helps them. I was watching him out of the corner of my eye while I'm breaking up this fight, like making sure he doesn't start anything. He just walked in, grabbed his stuff, helping them pack up, leave. Well, the bride saw him walk in and was like, what the hell are you doing back in here, blah, 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 calls attention to him, and then everybody like starts getting on him, and I'm like (laughs) grabbing him, like rushing him out the door. I'm like, all you guys... Just need to go home. So it was it was a fun, eventful weekend would, for me. I would be, I was about to say it sounds about what I'd imagine a Kentucky wedding would be. Like. <sighs> you know, I the sad thing is I can't argue with you because 
I mean, I just told you. <laughs> I can't argue that that it. The, oh my god. The level of it wasn't a little white trash. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, it's going to be a short podcast today because, uh, like I said, it's just us, and we're kind of on a week night. We're kind of strapped for time, so we're just going to cover the nitty gritty. And then on the weekend, we'll this weekend's up, so we'll be back to the regularly scheduled programming. Uh, first, we'll start with a little what we played this last Wednesday at Game Preserve. We played 500 points, Modern Age, and you had to play a named theme. It was a casual event. Resources were allowed, ATAs were not. Austin, what'd you play? I played a Stark Industries theme team, which ended up a lot better than I was expecting. Um, basically, I threw on there, I was like, well, I'm going to throw on the 150 point. Zero zero one Iron Man from the Invincible Iron Man set. Basically, the whole team was pretty much Invincible Iron Man for the most part because I wanted to play a bunch of figures I hadn't played yet. Uh, I threw on the one fifty Iron Man. I threw on the Rare War Machine, um, the Rescue, the Common Rescue, um, Happy Hogan with a Freak in the sideboard, um, and then two of the uh, Split Lip in the book, and then uh, two of the Stark in- Stark Solutions employees, which are like sixteen points. But all they do on their own when I don't have enough to full stack them is give an adjacent person plus one range on their perp or outwit. Well, I wanted to borrow one of the Iron Man War Machine duos to merge Iron Man War Machine if I really wanted to. Um, However, I quickly learned that you can merge them and then TK them because I didn't realize that you could TK a duo if it's on a single base. Correct. So this became the strategy for the rest of the night for me. I decided to turn one, merge them, turn two, rescue, TK them out, and then proceed to tear up my opponents. Um, First round almost went poorly for me, but once again my luck against Harry prevails, and he can't roll higher than a four six times in a row to save his life. (laughs) So, um, me and Harry's game was hilarious. Um, He was running that Batman that can bounce around corners with his shots from the Origin set, yeah, um, which was really cool, and he threw the power plate on there, was messing around with it. Um, my second game, what was my second? Jairus. Um, Jairus was running a bunch of Origins pieces, too. Like, the whole night was, the first, both those matches were just a ton of Origins pieces. Um, that dead shot, I underestimated his damage potential, and he almost took me out. Um, he's He's got kind of a short dial for his points, but he, he's a pretty powerful piece if you if you don't pay attention to him and you kind of ignore him for a little bit. Um, I won that match, and then I went on to my third game against a full Spider-Man team. That was twenty ninety nine. It was Kane, um, Spider-Girl, and the new AVX Spider-Man with uh, Madam Web. Um, and it was a really good team. Um, I got, once again, I got pretty lucky. He missed most of his super senses. Um, and twenty ninety nine is scary on that bottom dial if you don't take care of him right then and there. And the problem I have with that do is it doesn't have pin sigh. So I'm trying to hit an impervious character, do three damage to him to get him off the board, and with duo attack I pretty much had two shots to do it. So I was hoping he wouldn't double hit in imperv and just proceed to blast me and take me out. Yeah. Um, I won that match. I ended second place overall. Um, once again, that duo came through for me. I love that piece to death. Um, I'm really looking forward to playing it a lot more. Um, Rescue was a big star player. I'll talk about her more later. Um Really like that piece for 65 points with the capabilities it has. Um, that double bolt end cap is amazing when you get good chances to use it. Um, Happy Hogan was fun. I, I gave him a hammer a few times and he went to town when he turned into Freak. Um, it, it was a fun night overall. I mean, all the teams I went up against were really, really good teams. Um, what did you end up Doesn't with? Doesn't that, um, does Rescue have TK too? Yeah, she has TK yeah. and cap on her first click and double bolt she's for 65 so points. Yeah. And I, uh, she's not in Dom, but... She's not? I don't think so. I thought she was. Well, anyways. Yeah, she's not. She has um, force blast, though. I play... Oh, she can carry with an 11 freaking movement. Um, but only if they're single base characters and not on their first click. I played... Uh, no, she can use... Oh, I didn't even She can use that. it once regularly, or she can carry up to three if they're not on their start click. Well, she can still use it regularly. Yeah. And, uh, and she has perp. I, um... <clears throat> I played just a typical uh, X Factor team. I've been waiting, you know, to play X Factor for a long time, and I've played one or two of the pieces. I still haven't hadn't gotten to play Longshot yet, who was like the main man I wanted to play. I had played Shadowstar a couple times. Other than that, I don't think I had played any other people. That I played. Longshot is really annoying. 
I played Longshot, Richter, Shatterstar, the Jean Grey that I said was the best gravity feed piece, her and the Shi'ar Guard. My goodness, she's freaking ridiculous. Uh, she can carry up to three of them because they all have x Factor keyword. Uh, I'm forgetting somebody. I'll put it together while I'm sitting here, but I got first overall, surprisingly, with an X-Factor theme team. I was mad. Um, I wanted first place. Yeah, we went first and second, both three. No, I just had a few more points than you. Richter. Oh, I know what I played. I played one full points, multiple man main set, and a 25 point. Uh, Richter, yeah, Richter, Shatterstar, Longshot, and the Jean Grey. And uh, who am I forgetting? Long shot, Shatterstar, multiple mans, Richter, Jean Grey. I'm forgetting one person. Anyways, I'll figure it out in a second. So, and I had the the book. Was it 400 points or was it three? It was, it was 500. It was 500. <clears throat> and my team basically was revolved around. Um, moving, I was playing on the Spider-Man bridge map, and I was, oh, Wolfsbane, that's who it was, Wolfsbane and Book. I was playing on the, the web, the bridge map, and... You know what I have to say about that map? I, screw that I map. love that map. Royally screw and that I, map. And I, I learned to love it even more, because I originally picked it, because Jean Grey has really good range, 8 range, 2 bolt, and I was like, I'll use reflection in the book to pump that up to a 9, and I'll sit on top of the bridge and take shots. Well, first game, I start looking at the map, and I'm like, son of a bitch. The way that the starting zone is set up, you can go left to right from your starting zone and carry your people over top of it, and you'll be five squares away from the starting zone, yet still as far back vertically from the opponent's yeah. team, and you can drop hammers in your start, basically in your starting zone. Yeah. So, I did that. First game, actually, I didn't even use a hammer, or I did at the very end. Uh, I was playing against an Alpha Flight theme team, and... If you kind of look at the Alpha Flight pieces, almost all of them have hypersonic. Yeah, they don't play games. And he moved his team pretty much almost halfway all the way up the map. And like I said, a lot of them had hypersonic. So I was like, well, I either go up and set up hammers and get slapped with a few hypersonics, or I just go ahead and just go right <laughs> at them. And I was like, Gene Gray has the range <laughs> to do it. So I moved the long shot up to prob. I running shot with Jean Grey and carried because when she running shot, she doesn't negative her defense or whatever. Uh, so I running shot, two bolts, hit a big clump of guys, Shatterstar uh, did his X portal, dropped Richter into a line of three people who were in a vertical line. He quaked and hit all three of them. And the guy was like, well, I didn't see that coming. And I was like, well, you know, you've moved all your hypersonic guys up within hypersonic range. In a perfect line. I was like, what do you expect me to do? Like, sit back and and not do anything? Like, I'm going to go after you if I can go after you. It's, it's your own fault. Um, he's kind of salty. And uh, second, I, so I didn't even use the book until the very end. Although I will say, Shaman really screwed me. Oh, that's right. I couldn't carry the first round of the first game because uh, Shaman so, takes away yeah. flight. But also takes away from his guys, and a lot of his guys had flight too, so it kind of hurt him a little bit. If that Shaman took it away from the opposing team, he'd be so much better, but he's still pretty good for his points. Yep. Uh, so that first game was really easy for me. I don't even know if I lost a piece. The second game I played... Uh, shit, what was the second team? Oh, it was... Uh, Mystics. It was uh, Avenger set Thor at full points, who can basically reach full map on turn one energy explosion on the map, on the bridge map. Mm -hmm. and Heimdall and Valkyrie from uh, Fear Itself. So what I did was run sideways, like I said, carried sideways, dropped hammers. I rushed in a multiple man to tie up Thor because he was going to energy explode all over my little group of hammer bros. I rush up multiple man. He rushes in. He's like, screw that. I'll just kill multiple man with Valkyrie, and then I'll rush up, and then Thor will go and uh, fly over an energy explode. He hits multiple man for three, which spits me out three dupes. And I basically put him in a way where there's no way that Thor can get away <laughs> and get around and shoot my guys. And he tries to break away, and I was like, I'll burn all four of my theme team props on you breaking away. And I burned two of them, and he didn't get away, and I just 
proceeded to kick his ass because Jean Grey has eight range, two bolts, psychic blast with a hammer. She's like a twelve and a four, and you use a perplexer two on her damage, and she's just shit blasted everybody. So I uh, had Jean Grey sitting up on top of the bridge, like I said, taking shots hey, down. Screw the bridge. Um, <laughs> I really, really think. Um, people need to take a look at second look at Wolfsbane because she paid off big time for me. I gave her Scotty's hammer so that she could charge Blade's exploit because she has low damage, uh, but she has high attack already mm-hmm. with an eleven. And so, blades. so yeah, I, I she also has super senses and toughness, so she's a little tough to hit. Um, and she ignores shape change with Battle Fury, so I gave her Scotty's. Charge Blades exploited. Um, she did really well. The multiple men's were a blast. I. At first glance, when I first saw the two different multiple men spoiled when the set first came out, I was like, I like the Gravity Feed ones better. However, I played the Gravity Feed, uh, what, two weeks ago, and I played these guys this week, and these guys are a lot better, actually. The only reason I like the Gravity Feed ones is I like them mixed in a little bit because they have Empower. Yeah, and so well, and Perplex running, yeah. at some points. So if you were running a full multiple man team, having a few of them in there, they also get the X Men team ability, which these this version doesn't. Oh, I didn't. And even notice so that. you could have a you know a cheap little multiple man dupe that is healing the, your big dudes. The other ones duplicate when they when they hit their super senses, correct? Correct. Okay. These guys, when they take damage and they land on a click, however much they took, they spit out that many dupes. Um, and they also are harder to hit because they have 17 reflexes on top dial of both the 75 point and the 25 point versions. And he can absorb it. He can absorb one, remove it from the field, and heal himself one. So the main one, I usually would do that, keep healing him up. Yeah. While the rest of them kept charging with hammers and quaking, and it was it was a blast. Um, long shot was pretty good, pretty useful. I would usually keep him back and have him do cleanup. I'd have Jean Grey pop people off dampeners. And then a turn or two later, Richter would come in, Quake, and the you know, long shot would shoot three people, two, 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 you know, yeah. something like that. <laughs> and uh, Shatterstar's, of course, really good too. I gave him anger so that he could heal with his uh, charge flurry and blade. So, uh, third game was against a mystical team with Black Adam, and it was a pretty, um, it was a little cerebral game at the very beginning. But I ended up taking the better, the, getting the best of my opponent by uh, using some range strategy and using perplexes to stay. He had like four probs and like six or seven range on all of them, but Gene had eight. And I used some perplexes on range and was able to psychic blast Black Adam and um, stay out of his prob range while staying in mine because I needed to hit like a nine because he put three perps on him and um, he's already like a 19 or something. Yep. And he has that impervious thing, but I don't care about that because that's psychic blast. So I hit I managed to hit him for like four, and then from there I I teleported in and uh finished him off with Shatterstar the next turn. I've talked about that black item before. Like I like the piece, but I think as power levels are shifting and attack values are getting higher, he's getting less and less useful to me. Like he's still good, but he's nowhere near the power piece he really was. He's still really good. Um and he was trying his hardest to protect him. Yeah. And he was doing a pretty good job of it. I just I waited until I saw the perfect opportunity. I took it, and I burned a, a prob and a theme team prob, but it was worth getting that four penetrating on Black Adam uh, to put him on a sweet spot where he doesn't have Impervious, but he doesn't have that chain regen shit that gets yeah. him back up. So um, I, I took the rest of that game relatively easily, although he did have a lot of Mystics. Hey. So yeah, I was like, hey, this little X-Factor team won. I... I did. I will say one thing. I treated the games very seriously this time, uh, which is something I haven't done in a while at either Dugout or Game Preserve. I sat and really thought about every single move, and uh, really thought you know every single action out in turns you know one or two ahead of time, and really tr- tried to kind of prepare for our ROC event that comes up this week. And I think that's what did it for me. Not just the the decently. Uh, decent piece pretty good pieces that i played so i was pretty happy with that we got some good prizes and had fun now you guys saturday at dugout did an event i wasn't there because of the wedding i so got to judge so i had you and drew running it and it was 300 points silver age you must play a generic theme team now uh, nothing allowed except resources i want to say the one thing straightforward about judging that i have a new respect for how impatient people are with telling you scores when you're trying to do math Yes. Made me want to strangle everybody in a 15-foot radius. It's only a couple people, <laughs> but they are really bad about it. It was it got pretty bad for a while there. Um, but I played... Uh, 
I played a police generic team, but I went with a weird one. I went with uh, Cerise with Gauntlet um, and a few other police support pieces. I went with the Commissioner Gordon that can power action to make someone running shot next to him. He has enhancement. Um, the Harvey that gives stealth to everyone adjacent if they have a keyword or team ability with him. Um, and uh, what's her name? Bethany Cabe from the new Iron Man Elise. Um, Cerise, I, I held a lot of weight on her capabilities. And I kind of pushed my limits a little poorly with it. Um, my first match was against Shuma and two Scarlet Witches. And I actually had a chance to take that match. Um, when I should have stayed back and kept rolling Gauntlet to spin it. Um, what I did instead was moved up. He went forward, swung at Cerise. Had he missed, I would have had an opportunity to pin Sai for 7 on him, which would have one-shot him. And I could have taken the game from there, probably. It was a really swinging match. Um, I made a lot of poor decisions right out the gate. Was still kind of learning my pieces and positioning with them. Because with police figures, that really matters. Um, trying to keep your enhances in the right places, your police team abilities. Yeah. Um, at least against a Colossal, when you police ball like that, it's really easy. Yeah, police are sick against Colossals and yeah. Hydra. And that game, I, I almost had a chance to sweep it because of that. But I, I threw it away like an idiot. Um, my next two matches... Um, I went up against a werewolf team that was, like, seven werewolves and blade. The only annoying thing about fighting a werewolf team is when they roll, having to shift them every turn, pretty much. Um, the Harvey actually has a damage ability that stops everyone within eight squares, um, all opponents and characters, from using shape change, which was really helpful. Um, That's right. Yeah, he so does I, uh, Harvey Bullock. Yeah. Yeah. Hilariously, I ended up picking the Pacific Ocean map. Um, because it had good elevation for me to stagger my pieces, but it also gave me some ramps I could block with like Harvey and some other pieces that don't do damage on their own. Um, so I used them to block, had Cerise up on the cliff, and she's just throwing down pin side bolts repeatedly from up above, um, and I'm turning the gauntlet every turn. Bethany Cabe actually put out decent damage output in that game because there wasn't a lot of dampeners on those werewolves. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up taking the game. Um, it was a pretty good game. Um, it... My team just didn't have the defensive capabilities because most of them didn't have dampeners at all. Yeah, it's or a police any defensive goes. abilities. Yeah, um, that's a common theme with police teams. Um, so when he had another swarm like that, the werewolves moved up. They'd smack like a crappy 14 defense one and give scent of blood and just come tear into everything. Um, I don't remember what my other match was. Um, but overall, I didn't like my Cerise team too much. I, I don't know. I just feel like... Cerise is better with the gauntlet if you pair her with a team base, where you have to have a piece that can't have a resource, and you just need to fill that last bit of points. She's a better secondary attacker than a primary crutch. Yeah. Um, she but, doesn't put mm, out enough damage to be a primary attacker. Yeah, I had I had the enhancement and a perplex or whatever to help her out, but it, it, it wasn't enough to really make her worth it when I'm only throwing out that one attack every turn with her. Who um, was playing two moment, or two... Scarlet Witches and Shuma. Terrence. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> That's Shuma. <laughs> That's sad that I have to put no Colossals <laughs> on a generic theme team. It's freaking, but that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, Shuma, Shuma and two Scarlet Witches. Um, it was two of the... It was the really old Scarlet Witch. The 35 point. Yeah, and uh, I think the new... It wasn't the new 100 point one. It was the 50 point switch. Yeah, it was a funny team. Um... And let me guess, he had, like, belt on Shuma or something? No, I don't think he was running a resource. Oh, gosh. It's sad that my venue has turned to this often. <laughs> I, used to I don't know, to, I could have one-shot it. I used to be able to put up whatever I wanted and not have to worry about it. Now, I have to be I have to be careful with my children. Because <laughs> they're not responsible anymore. They're teenagers. No, they just get, know that when you're in Kentucky beating up people, <laughs> that they can take advantage. They're teenagers <laughs> who try to get, take advantage of whatever opportunity they can find. Um, so that's it for this week. We have our ROC coming up tomorrow. Woo! Because we are recording on Tuesday night, so we'll see how that goes. Um. I'm going to make some people cry, Hunter. I feel really good about my team, except there are two matchups that I really foresee being a huge problem, and the problem is I, those two matchups, I foresee at least a couple people playing, so I guess we'll see how it goes. We're going to play test our teams here in a second. I'm going to tear you a new one, buddy. Uh, let's move into news, and there actually was quite a bit of news this week. Uh, let's start off with all the Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. 
uh, Breaker, the Magic. If you guys want to follow along, go to HeroClicks.com, and the vast majority of these will be on there if you want to look at these pieces with us as you listen. Uh, Breaker, the Magical Warrior, has a trait, and it's, it is really cool. Yeah, I really uh, like this piece. He begins the game with a spell token on his card. While the token is on his card, he can use Super Senses. You can give him a power action and take the spell token... Remove the spell token to deal 2 pin damage to an opposing character within 6 squares in line of fire. Or give him a free action and remove the spell token to deal 1 pin to an opposing character within 6 squares in line of fire. So basically at any time you have the option to hit somebody without for 2 penetrating without having to make an attack, deal with super senses, or hitting your roll, yeah. like... Just boom, two damage. And that can be really freaking useful. Yeah, I can already think of a few cases right here on, like, I'm not going to say them out loud, but I can think of a few cases I'd run that one with. 116 points, though, for the rest of his dial with no willpower. The, he's not a bad piece. He's he's basically average, I think. The one thing I do like, though, about him having the spell token on is he has super senses and invul. Which means that either or, um, if penetrating, if he's going to get hit with penetrating, at least he has super senses for it. And if he's going to hit with normal damage, he has super senses and invul. So it's not too bad. Um, I think for 116, he still feels a little bit more than I'd want to spend on a 116 point figure. Um, I still like his mechanic. Um, I think he'll be a fun piece, um, particularly if we end up playing like Yu-Gi-Oh sealed or like if we're just playing Yu-Gi-Oh versus Yu-Gi-Oh. I definitely see some good cases. Um, that stupid cat thing where if you hit it with an attack, or morphing jars we're going to get to in a minute, there's a lot of things that trigger when they're hit with attacks, um, that pulling a token off hitting for two pin would at least push you a little forward towards um, taking out without having to actually hit them. Next up is Flame Swordsman. I like this one. He's 95 points. <laughs> he does have Indom. He has Charge and Sidestep as his movement power with Precision Strike. Uh, yeah. Close combat expert and toughness. And then later in his dial for his last three clicks, he gets a special attack power called Flaming Sword of Battle. He can use blades and poison. When he uses blades and rolls of five to six, after action to resolve, all damage dealt to the hit character is increased by one until your next turn. See, I'm kind of sad because the poison, if for some reason he could trigger that before poison would go off for any reason... Technically, the poison being increased, it's all damage. Right. Oh, yeah. wait. It's after. Would, okay, here's a weird question. All right. Would pushing damage count? All damage dealt. Um, I'm not sure. This says all damage dealt instead of uh, deal at one out of one. It might, actually. I probably would. But and that, may, that makes them a lot You'd more You'd have to double check it, but yeah. It, it Especially in this could. set with no willpower? He has a really good dial. Actually, I actually really like him for ninety five. Oh yeah, points. I definitely like him for ninety six um, or ninety five. He has moving into he has charge for his first four uh, first four clicks. Uh, the first two he has the charge and sidestep, and then the last two he has sidestep. So he always has some mobility and uh, pretty good attack capability. His as well. damage never really di it dips to a two on his third click, but the rest are all threes. Yeah, and he has a um, close precision combat strike and close combat expert when he does that. I like him for ninety five points. I do too. Uh, Morphing this Jar <laughs> is really cool. Morphing Jar has a trait. Once per game, when Morphing Jar is hit with an attack after actions resolve, starting with you, each player chooses a friendly character and places it into an opponent's starting area until all characters have been placed. So you pick a character that you want to put in their starting zone, then they pick one that they want to put in yours, and you keep going until all the characters are gone. He also has prop control and perplex on his damage ability. He's 50 points. He has no attack or damage his entire dial, though he does pick up late dial poison. He does have phasing teleport. But his movement values are 5, 4, 3, and 2. Uh, this guy's really cool. He's going to be a combo piece, of course. Uh, I already said Ragnarok Surger with him, where you send him out, he gets hit, send Ragnarok Surger to your starting opponent's starting area, and then everybody who, as long as you're on a good map. Yeah. Uh, everybody who he can see just takes one pin. Next turn, everybody takes one pin, and they they, they have to take it while they're moving up to you. So he'd and be really fun. Even even at his base, though, he's a fifty point perplex prob phasing teleport with energy shield that puts him at eighteen. Yeah, I was gonna That's say he's terrible. he's an eighteen too, so he's not. The only thing he's forward. lacking in is keywords because he has the basic Yu Gi Oh ones. Yeah, but uh, 
Really, like really cool piece though. It, it's always fun to get pieces who do something very specific like that. My only worry with... about running him is if an opponent takes advantage of the slap him and send him to your. Or if your opponent's like, "Well, crap! I need to get the heck out of this situation," and smacks him and then teleports all his figures to your starting area and supports a bunch of stuff. Um, there, but... we also got Law Jin, who was one of my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh cards. He had like an eighteen hundred attack for oh, yeah. like a four drop. He was really good, or maybe it was nineteen hundred. Uh, he has a trait. Each time he is hit by an attack and that attack resolves, he modifies his defense value by plus two until your next turn. He has Shape Change, uh, in, in Dom, and in Vol, and he has Pulse Wave, but he doesn't have any move and attack on his top dial. He has Pulse Wave, actually, all his clicks except his last one. He has seven clicks. And those he has Pulse Wave and Shape Change almost every click. So he does have in Dom, which helps his lack of move and attack a little bit. Um, we'll see how much Pulse Wave is in the Yu-Gi-Oh set. If there's not a lot, then he's a pretty good piece. You know what's piece. great about that Pulse Wave? Once again, we have two figures that if they're hit by an attack, trigger effects. Yeah, so pulse they could get around them, it. So yeah. um, I like him. Uh, he's a little expensive for not having any clicks of move and attack. Yeah. But he does get some sidestep later. And, he and does, he's carryable, at least. Yeah, and he does have that full... Um, Almost full dial shape change in Pulse Wave, so that's... He, he's basically an average piece. Not bad. Yeah. Now, this guy I really like, too, who is a Sura Priest. He is 49 points, and he has a couple different really cool, like, basically, attack abilities. Uh, first one, you give him a double power action. He does not have uh, will... Or does he have willpower? Yeah. Um, on the top. You're going to open the door. Does he have it when he has it at the same time? I don't... I'll look I it think up. so. He, uh... You give him a double power action, he can immediately make four close combat attacks as free actions, but he can't target the same character with more than two of those attacks. And, and he does have that with willpower and battle fury. You know what I like about that, though? Basically, uh, you could use him to finish off a group of smaller characters mm -hmm. and just be like, smack, 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 and just... Because he's got two damage... He's not going to get through a lot of, or it's yeah, it's not going to get through um, M, M dot or Invol or Imperv or anything like that. But um, it's too bad we don't have a way to give him Precision Strike. Yeah, Precision like, Strike, but that would be ridiculous. So he has the the four attacks abilities on his first three clicks with ten attack, and then on his last three clicks he has a regular flurry and a special attack power, which is really good. Yeah, once per game. Give a Sura Priest a ranged combat action, even if he is adjacent to an opposing character. Make a ranged combat attack with an AoE targeting each opposing character within six squares in line of fire. For each hit character, roll a d6 and deal that character that much damage. So he, On a what? 95 point piece? Yeah, so it, in the right situation, this dude can dish out like... Basically, unlimited amounts of damage yeah. if you run. If you, you get, roll you right. get them up close, and you just sit there and you swing a bunch on people with the double power action. Oh no, they hit you down dial. Boom! All of a sudden, you're doing this mini kind of pulse wave ish thing for up to a d6 to each character, and it doesn't say that can't be rerolled, does it? No. Oh, yeah, that's buddy. what I was looking at. It, that you can reroll it. So. Pretty, pretty cool. I'm liking these Yu-Gi-Oh! pieces a lot so far. I, at least they're not... like. Remember when we stole the starter ones and we were like, oh, the these are all... Really they're all just cut and dry, like regular powers. I don't even think really any of them have any special powers. None of the starter ones did. So it's cool to see these guys because they do have you know special stuff. Uh, moving on to Superman Legion of Superheroes. We got Mr. Miracle, who's really cool. That's one more piece for me to put on my Justice League uh, Beyond team. He's got JLI too. So we, I've got him, I've got Batman Beyond, and Superman Beyond. We need some more of the, the rest of the team. We just need a Beyond set. I know. We. The, I don't know. I'm kind of giving a pope on that, but I guess only time will tell. Mr. Miracle is a very um, interesting piece. He's 127 points, no Indom flight symbol, and two bolts, five range. He ignores uh, elevated blocking and characters on movement, and he has a trait. When he would be hit by an attack... If you give him an action token, he evades the attack instead. Pretty goddamn useful. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, Blue Beetle, but not once per game. Yeah. And uh, he ha has a special damage ability, too. He has Outwit and Shape Change. 
He can use Empower, but only to modify the damage value of a friendly character named B- Big Barda. See, so he also has Super Senses. So that's he, what I was about to say. He's yeah, got shape stealth, change. Super Senses, Shape Change, and that ability. Yeah, Stealth, Super Senses, Shape Change. And then if you finally do get through all of those, then he can just give an action token and take one instead of, you know, if that is if he even is pushing at the time, take one damage instead of the four that you were going to hit him for. And he has high defense values. Like he, he's always a 17 or 18. If you notice, and he gets prob down dial. Yeah, he gets in late dial. He gets prob and he gets eighteen and seventeen defense. And he has in cap every now and then on his dial. So mainly he's kind of an aggravation support. He's kind of a weird, unique piece. Like he can taxi. He supports your team because he has outwit and prob. He and also in cap. Um, he also is kind of a tie-up piece because he's so hard to hit, and then when you do hit him, he doesn't go away. I don't know how I feel so, about his empower though. Well, that's just kind of a flavor thing. Basically, yeah. I don't. Need, I just basically pretend it's not even on the dial. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. I'm just saying he I, still has outwit and shape change. But here's what I'm wondering. I wonder if we're gonna get another big Barda in this set since it's all about the new gods. Maybe, but I think it's just because they're married and they just want to add flavor to the piece. Yeah. And and that big Barda is not gonna go Golden Age anytime soon. So. That's true. Next up, we have Block. I like Block. He's 155. He's a wild card. Um, he does not have the, um, what's it called? Founders. Founders. Uh, he just has a regular Legion wild card. And he, Future and Mystical. Uh, he has a trait for my love. When Block is adjacent to a friendly character named White Witch or Black Witch, that character can use Mastermind, but only to transfer damage to Block regardless of his point value. Now, that's pretty good because he has freaking Impervious. Oh, yeah. And he has a special defense power later in his dial, which is Invul. And when he's targeted with ranged, he can use Impervious instead. So he also has a special movement, which is Charge and Quake. And when he charges, he busts blocking and ignores characters. He has good values with that, too. An 11 attack and a 4 damage top click. So he's your typical he's a, brick. He's, he's a little a block. Ex- <laughs> yeah, He's a little expensive for a brick, but he does good damage. I, and if you play him with that white witch or black witch, then it, that's what I was gonna say. Even if they're halfway decent pieces, he is a good, a really good yeah. piece. So I guess we'll see. We'll hold our excitement until we see white witch or uh, black witch. But I do like the other him. thing I was gonna bring up about him though is he does have a really low movement, like eight, seven, six. Mm-hmm. Um, which with charge, an eight is like is four movement on your charge, which is pretty restrictive. But if that black or white witch has flight capabilities or something where they can carry him, then mastermind onto him, it'll be Well, a he's a flyer. Oh, he is a flyer. Yeah. I didn't even notice that. But he's a flyer? He is slow, but, you know, well, he's in space, so oh, true. everybody flies. Um, he does have low movement, but he does bust through blocking, at least, and ignores, and ignores characters, character, so he, yeah. can, he doesn't have to worry about going around. <laughs> the one everybody's most excited for is Bizarro. And he is a he has only a gonna, chiseled man jaw. He's only going to be a rare, so luckily everybody's going to be able to get him without spending a bunch of money. Bizarro's the first clicks that I can think of that has uh, this unique point cost. Basically, you can pay anywhere from twenty five to three hundred, and in increments of twenty five points. So twenty five, fifty, seventy five, one hundred, however much you want. He's basically the best filler piece that's ever been in the game of hero clicks um <laughs> with those keywords especially he yeah brute legion of doom metropolis and monster so at least he has monster his trade is he costs 25 for each or zip token which is bizarro backwards yep. uh you place on his card up to 12 so up to 300 points when he takes damage you remove one token from his card when he is healed add one token to his card someone pointed this out to me that means if you support him it really doesn't matter how much you roll. As long as you hit the attack, he gets a token. So, like... Well, support's well, I guess always minimum support's always one anyways. One, yeah. yeah, somebody True. brought that up, and I was like, support's minimum one anyways. True. Like, what the hell do you... I forget about like, that. Like, what the hell does it matter? But anyways, I didn't say anything on the Facebook post. Uh, when there are no Bizarro tokens on this card, KO Bizarro. At the beginning of your turn, roll a d6 and click Bizarro that many times. I didn't even notice he did that every turn. I thought he just clicked whenever yeah. uh, he lost tokens, but... No, no every, every turn he every changes. Turn. So that's kind of the the negative effect, because if you look at his dial, and you guys will have to look at it uh, on HeroClicks.com because it's too crazy for me to describe, but it had there's not a horrible click on this thing. For 25 points, 
Yeah, he's got a few nine attack. P- oh yeah, still that's what you're saying. on the nine. Okay, you pay twenty five points. You're gonna start. He's gonna start the game at nine hypersonic, nine super strength. Well, no, it's beginning of your turn. You roll it. Oh yeah, that's true. So I guess that yeah, you'd roll it. Start on anything. He could start on sidestep hunter. I mean, he could. S- but look at all those clicks. You telling me there's a click on there that's not worth twenty five points? I know. There's not there. <laughs> there really isn't. And uh, he also has Superman enemy TA, so even paying 25 points to bring your wild card Superman enemy is useful too. Did you see the best part about his card? Read the flavor text and all that. Oh, yeah, they screwed up all the... So if you guys look at his card, (laughs) they put the wrong names of the powers on purpose. It threw me for a loop the first time. The shape change box says exploit weakness, the pervious box says super senses, and it's all screwed up. His exploit weakness is called range combat. Yeah, I'm sure new new, uh, players are not going to be messed up at all by (laughs) Bizarro's card. So I'm very excited for this figure. This set keeps looking better and better as it goes on. So It wasn't a set I was excited for, but every time they spoil something, I get a little more excited for it. Uh, in other news, the first episode of The Quarry is up, which is the ROC podcast that Edward and I will be on. The uh, first episode is only 15 minutes long. It's just a short interview with Howard Blo- uh, Brock, who is the creator of ROC, ROC, basically the guy running everything. And there's some good uh, information in there and some good insight. And like I said, it's only 15 minutes. It's on the front page of HC Realms if you guys want to check it out. So basically, the the typical weekly podcasts are just going to be a few minutes like that. And they'll be kind of uh, Edward doing interviews and short little podcasts. And then after big events, like the one that was this past week. So coming up very soon, there will be the kind of round table with me and Edward and some of the guys. And uh, be talking about... The results of the the major tournament and what we you know talking about the state of the meta and what we expect to see and and uh, what shock you know just kind of the whole nine yards it'll be kind of like a roundtable discussion. I'm expecting a zombie meta team. So, so which one of you guys is going to be the Charles Barkley? So there's a reason we don't have Austin on the podcast. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I heard everybody should be pushing this new zombie meta. Uh, no, and then Hunter'd be like, "That's terrible. That's terrible, terrible, terrible." I want to say I'm the Charles Barkley because. <laughs> Even though I'm... Okay, here here's the thing about Charles. Charles is one of the best basketball players of all time, no question. I mean, for anybody who's studied the game, especially... He was on Space Jam, Hunter. Especially one of the best de- <laughs> defensive players of the game. But he's not articulate. <laughs> really? And he kind of knows the stuff, but he kind of doesn't. He, he's smart, but he doesn't really seem that smart, you know, when you hear him talk. And so I feel like that's how Charles... Like, I'm a good player, but I've don't always come across as intelligent as I probably am. <laughs> so I feel like I'd be a good Charles Barkley. That's terrible. You're terrible. So <laughs> I'll be sure to sneak in the word terrible here and there, just so you guys kind of get the inside joke for our <laughs> podcast. And you'll think it's hilarious. They probably will not catch it. or They'll start podcast. getting on you about it and be like, you got to stop saying that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> this is insulting. So we'll see how it goes. But for now, check out uh, episode one. And it's a, it's a really good, really cool, quick interview with uh, Howard. Um, let's move into main topic today, which is Iron Man Sealed. We were going to talk about it last week, but we ended up having an opportunity where we could get everybody together for the 2013 recap episode. So we did that instead. Mm -hmm. This week we're going to talk about Iron Man Sealed. For each one, Austin and I are going to go through the common, uncommon, and rare slots. We're going to give you our top three, uh, what we feel are the best choices. We'll alternate and we will not copy each other. I'll let you go first. And so if I say one that you have on your list, then you have to pick a new one. That's bull crap. I'll, and I'll, that's why well, I'm letting you go first. You didn't tell me this when I made my list, or I would have put the extra ones on there. <laughs> and uh, I'll pull this up, too, just in case I throw you for a loop. You can, you know, glance at the <laughs> pieces. So uh, I do want to, before we start, mention that we are not including common, uh, common prime. Like, the primes are not included in the common section, for example. And for the super rares, chases, and primes... We're going to do them all as one section. We'll just call it the special section because they're all kind of crazy harder to get rarity. Yeah. And sealed, you can't really depend on pulling all those pieces. So we will go over what we think are the best ones, but we won't go over each section individually. So we'll start with common. And what is the best common for sealed in the set, Austin Smith? Rescue. I think rescue rescue is a great piece. Um, TK in cap alone for 65 points is good enough. Down dial, she's an awesome support piece. Has like an 11 attack support or whatever down dial. Um, she's like 5 or 6 clicks. She doesn't have super offensive capability, but when you're playing this kind of event where 
in sealed people are maybe only running two or three figures, um, you're looking at a double bolt in cap, which is great. There's not a lot of willpower. Um, once again, only two or three figures per team. You're able to lock down two of their pieces or force them to push. That's huge. Or you're forcing them to only take one action every other turn. I mean, like... Overall, she's a great, great piece for her points, and Perplex that can't modify damage is great, too. Um, I mean, and Flight, she can carry somebody. There's just so many... She is a Swiss Army knife of a sealed piece, and she's at Common. If I pull her in my pack, she's going on my team. Yep, I agree. I I think she's the best overall piece, too, so I'll go with my number two, which is Brothers Grimm. Um, especially if you can manage to pull two of them together, which I just saw somebody do when we played it at GP. I saw it done twice, and it uh, frustrates me. Um, he's 66 <laughs> points with the Mystic's ability. He has prop control and perplex on almost all of his dial. He also has poison on almost all of his dial. And so that right there, I mean, support with poison and Mystic's. And, oh, sorry, and he's a flyer, so he can carry too. So he's a good support piece, plus provides the Mystic's team ability. And then if you can happen to uh, get his trait, then he's even better. If there's exactly one other friendly Brothers Grimm on the map... Modify this character's attack plus one. If that character is adjacent, modify all of those characters' values plus one instead. And you may be give you may give both brother scrims a free action to be placed in each other's squares. The one thing he kind of remind I want to say he kind of reminds me of Monkey King from Fear itself when it comes to this sealed because he's a cheap common piece that's a good flyer, but he has prob on top of that and mystics and stealth. A smoke Whereas cloud Monkey too. King, I forgot yeah. to mention smoke cloud. Whereas Monkey King only had. Um, Quake and, like, something Quake, else. Quake, that was yeah, pretty much Quake. it. <laughs> so, I mean, like, for 65 points, yeah, I didn't even realize they were flyers. That makes them so much better. So, I definitely think they're probably top three. And, but I do agree. I think Rescue is the overall best common in the set. And, Austin, what's your next one? Uh, Justin Hammer. Um, I've, I saw him play to good effect during our sealed at GP. Um, 54 point outwitters, all right, and sealed. I mean, like, if you need a good outwitter, there's not a ton of outwit in this set that's cheap. Um, he's a go-to guy. Um, he gets perplexed down die a little bit. But what makes him really good in this set for sealed is he has two. He has a trait and he has a defense ability. His trait is characters with the armor, hammer, industries, or robot keyword may be targeted by his outwitter perplex if they're within 10 squares, regardless of line of fire or range. So what this means is if you're running him with a big tent pole, like I've seen him run with Silver Centurion, for instance, or even almost all the pieces that almost all the big pieces in the set at least have armor or hammer industries or robot, um, you can perp them um, when he gets down dial, or if you're against an opponent, you can outwit theirs. And a 10 range outwit for 54 points is nothing to scoff at. Um, and then his defense ability is great too. He can use Mastermind. He can use it to transfer damage to characters of 150 points or less if they're within three squares and have armor, hammer, industries, or robot. So you keep them kind of close to your big armor piece, like your Detroit or your Detroit Steel or maybe even your drones or whatever. You just sit there and you negate the damage off to them while you're perplexing them out from behind somewhere or while you're outwitting your opponent from halfway across the map. I like him for 54 points. Um, hammer Industries is also great on him because... If you have the ATA capabilities, like if your venue runs, if the ATA is showing, you could run that ATA on him if you have another piece with it. Yeah, I really hope that most places let you run um, the ATAs and the rings if you pull them because it really does add a lot more fun to the seal of does. Iron Man. Like the Mandarin team you ran where you pulled mm -hmm. pulled the ring. Yeah, Yeah, and, and I had ATAs on the other guys. So, yeah. I mean, there was another guy who pulled two rings and ran them on the Mandarin. I mean, like it's just fun. Uh, my second, uh, Justin Hammer is a good choice. Um, I, I didn't think he'd be all that great whenever we first saw him, but, uh, after seeing him in play, I've definitely heard some people get a lot of good play out of him, and now that I give him a second look, I do think he is a lot better than I initially gave him credit for. Old school 10 range out, it's a bit scary. In sometimes. Iron Man sealed, yeah. That's <laughs> something that you don't really think about when you look at it, the dial as being that good, but in game, it really is really useful. Uh, my second one... I can't decide. I think I'm going to go with 001 Iron Man at 150. I almost had him on my list. Um, I think the reason I like him so much is 8 range, first of all, with running shot. Uh, 5 square running shot. So he's got a 13 square swing plus shield ability, a TA. But he, the main thing is he has precision strike. Almost everything in the set has dampeners, and there's not a lot of ways around them. Not a lot of pieces uh, in this set have psychic blast. 
or exploit. Um, he has two ways. He has outwit and he has precision strike. And he has improved targeting and north blockings. So if you can get a good map or even just a good section of the map, he can really wreak some havoc. And he also could he has two bolts eight range, like I said, so you can outwit somebody, target two people, um, precision one strike three, one for one, yeah. and then the other one for three. Like in this set, getting around dampers is very important and I think he does it really well, better than almost all the other figures in the set. He's very glass jaw though. So you're gonna need to pull one or two pieces that at least one good either tie up or close combat piece to kind of take some of the attention away from him uh, because he will go down quick if they can either outwit him or somehow psychic blast him. He'll go down re- Some decently. sort of Justin Hammer 10 square. Away. Yeah, he'll go down pretty quick. So if, if you can... He does have 8 range, though. So, I mean, he's going to outrange almost oh, everybody. Yeah. So if you can keep him... And he ignores stealth. He ignores blocking. Yeah, he, yeah I mean, like... If you can keep him away, I think he's a very good piece for sealed. I almost had him on my list, but I had both versions um, because I do like the 300 point in sealed even. I mean, like, if I, I hate to say I'd throw all my eggs in one basket with one piece, but I would still feel kind of comfortable doing it at the full dial. Because he's have a 13 square range with running shot and 8 range double bolt, still precision strike, but has a 4 damage perplex, and he picks up the trait where he can use move and attack if he absolutely has to. And his attack went up to a 12. Yeah. So he drops only to a 10 to get a, tw- a 10 square hypersonic. Um... He he would be an alright piece to run as your full team if you played him smart, you kept him back, and you took advantage of his range. If you could if you played him and the opponent's probably only gonna have a ma- in this Iron Man sealed, I think they're only gonna have a maximum of one figure with either Outwit or Psychic Blast. Yep. If you can bust them first and get them off of it, they're gonna have to deal with your impervious, then you're invincible. That's what I was gonna say. Then the, you're invul and he will be a problem. So the thing I like about the that version of him particularly is he goes from two clicks of imperv to two clicks of invul, but if you land him on that fourth click, he picks up pinsight, five damage, and perplex with a ten attack. So, I mean, you, you purpose attack to an eleven, because that's pretty good to go to. You're blasting somebody for five damage, and you have invincible eighteen, which is huge in this set, because although attack values are still kind of high, an eighteen's pretty solid to be standing on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, liked, I liked both of them. Um... I had him on my list. I, I figured you were going to end up throwing the shorter one on there, actually, so I'm happy. I like that. them both. You, I'm glad you brought up the 300-point one because he is viable. Usually when you have a 300-point piece in sealed, it's not very viable. This guy can hit and get away, and he's hard to take down. The other, So I think he is worth it at 300. The big thing is when you were talking about the map, most sealed games um, you're, you play on the map that's provided with the OP kit typically. Correct, right. And the Iron Man sealed kit has a lot of blocking and hindering terrain on both sides. Yeah. So he's a great piece for that to just blow through It's walls. almost like made for this guy. Yeah. Actually. And that, that's one, the big reason I threw him on my list originally. Who's your number three common? What I replaced him with was a piece that I found mildly annoying that if I pulled I would almost play most of the times. And that is the Magia Goon. Um, he's a 20-point plasticity piece that is an absolute pain in the ass to deal with. Um, his defense his defense power is if he's hit by somebody, he uses their defense instead. So if you're up against somebody who's like running a 300-point Iron Man, for instance, and has an 18 defense, and they're punching at you, you now have an 18 defense. These guys are plasticity, so they stop them from getting around. There's some big hypersonic super rares and a few hypersonic rares and uncommons that are really annoying to deal with, especially from Alpha Flight. Um, He locks them up. He gives you really good positioning capabilities. And one of my favorite things that you could do with him is move up some pieces, take your swings in, and block doorways, because once again on these maps it's very indoorsy. There's lots lots of good tight corridors to lock enemies up in. And you can prevent your opponents from moving in a way that they want to, and they have to go all the way around or start blowing out walls and wasting actions. Mm -hmm. Um, For 20 points, he's a steal on most teams. Um, His offensive capabilities are meh. He drops onto exploit for 1 damage with an 8 attack, which is alright for 20 points. Well, now I'm pissed off because I had two that I could not pick between for my third choice, and you didn't pick either one of them, so now I can't (laughs) decide... It was between Guardian and Bulldozer. I think I'm going to go with Bulldozer. Having played against Bulldozer, I can see why. <laughs> Having played two of them in my sealed, uh, <laughs> I played them both at 70 points, which I think is the better option. 
Uh, the 145 gives you two extra clicks in Invul and a, another hit on damage and Masters of Evil, but I don't think it's quite worth. It definitely isn't. It. I guess it. Yeah, it's a whole 100. It's a whole 75 points. It, it's just too much. Well, the ma- the thing is, the Masters of Evil isn't really worth it at all. Like to me, like the fact he doesn't have willpower to begin with on his top click. Yeah. It's just like you're just gonna keep pushing him for damage, and he does get progressively worse. Save like one click down dial when he picks up a 10 attack and goes back up a little bit. Yeah, so I'm going to go with a 70 point version for my number 3. Uh, I, like I said, I played two of these guys. They're extremely useful, um, especially with the ATA. They are basically just your typical charge super strength brick pieces. However, they're pretty cheap at what they do. At only 70 points for dishing out 5 damage with and objects. that trait, son. And uh, the ATA is going to give them plus 1 attack, so they'd be a charge 11 attack, 5 damage if they have a heavy object. But the special thing that's so good with them is their trait. At the end of your turn, choose a side of the square that he occupies. Lines of fire drawn to bulldozer that pass through that side of the square are blocked until your next turn. So what I did, I had two 70-point bulldozers and the Mandarin with the ring. And I basically moved the bulldozers up, chose their front line, moved them up next to a wall, and ran the Mandarin up behind him, and my opponent could not shoot me. And basically, I could always get my bulldozers in as long as I positioned right. Uh, I could always get them in safely and then Mandarin in to range safely. And it re- it worked out really well. I think it went two and one. They annoyed... The first guy I would have guessed had one annoyed the <coughs> crap out of me. I did not enjoy playing against that bulldozer one bit. Um, basically, towards the end of the game, I was playing Nefaria. He just kept positioning himself and drawing to where I couldn't shoot at him and wanted to draw me into melee. And I'm like, I'm not falling for this. And so I just waited for him to finally get to where I could shoot him. It was. It really was a huge pace. It's kind of like the Magagoon. It's a huge pacing thing where you control where your opponent moves. And it gives you a major edge over your opponent. And on a 70-point piece, that's great. Yeah, I think this piece in the hands of a a decent to good player can really do wonders with that trait. And then let alone the fact that he dishes out good damage for his points. Once again, in corridor maps, too. So, yeah, and then honorable mention, Guardian, if you want to take him a look. He's a pretty good attacker for 100 points. So, on to Uncommons. I'll let you go first. Detroit Steel. That is a piece that I... Overlooked when I first saw him, and, and then I after, told you I was like, "That's ridiculous." After he kicked my ass and sealed, <laughs> I respect him. So there's a—I wouldn't say there's a ton of stealth in this set. There's some stealth in this set. Um, so right off the bat, any character that ignores hindering gets a nice little buff from me. Um, he ignores hindering. He ignores uh, characters. Is it? Or no, yeah. he ignores. Yeah, yeah, both. So he doesn't have sharpshooter, but he ignores opposing characters on his line of fire. But the combo with that is that he has Energy Explosion Precision Strike with one bolt at 7 range. He has a 10 square square movement with running shot and an 18 imperv, indom, 4 damage for 150 points. He has Hammer Industries, so you can pick up the Hammer Industries ATA. Um, Which is stupid good, by the way. Yeah. Soldier Armor. What you do is you can just run up there, your opponent's all balled up in stealth, Running shot, shoot the middle guy, and all of a sudden, one damage to everyone around them guaranteed, and then four to the middle guy, unless you perplex his damage, and it's five to the middle guy. I mean, like, he's a solid, solid piece. Um, I really like him, especially in this set. Um, Once again, Indom's not too common in this set. Um, So he's a great piece that has it. Um, Armor means that you can use a lot of Justin Hammer's abilities. If you pull both of them together, it's a great combo piece. Um, he's right under Justin Hammer's Mastermind, um, 150 or less. Um, they're built to be played together, pretty much. Um, once again, the Hammer ATA, I, I like him. I mean, like, Flyer, he can carry. Just a good all-around piece. Down dial, he drops into Melee Exploit. Second click, actually, he's Melee Exploit, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have, I, if I would have pulled him, I would have played him in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's a, him and uh, Iron Man 2.0, or Monger 2.0 were the, the team that beat me, both with the ATAs. And his impervious, like I said, in the set, it's really hard to get around dampers. You finally get him off of it, and then he goes on a charge exploit with super strength, and he's just, he's really tough to and deal with. And the most important part is his energy explosion precision strike is called Chain Gun for America. Uh, I really hate the uncommon slot in this set. There are not a lot of good choices to choose from. Detroit Steel is really good, though. I'm also going to go with Tony Stark if you can pull somebody to play with him. Like 
Um, Argonauts Tony is <laughs> zero like fifteen. The steal to play with him. Yeah, uh, he <laughs> alternates outwit and perplex most of his dial. He has a special mind control. He can use it only to target a single character with armor or robot, but he may target friendly characters. Now, I do want to bring up, and we learned this this weekend, um, energy shield will affect ranged mind control on friendly characters. Correct. Because it is not an optional thing. It is always plus two defense from um, ranged attacks. So with this piece particularly, and with Molman too, I think we've probably missed that once or twice in the past at some point. Maybe. Although monsters don't usually have any That's issue. True. But um, another cool thing I like about this guy is his defensive power because then it makes you not afraid to push him. Uh, it, he has regen and toughness at the beginning of your turn. If he hasn't taken damage since your last turn, heal him of one damage. His power can't be outwitted. So if you can keep him behind your guy who he's mind controlling, he can keep pushing and then the next turn he's going to heal it anyways as long as he stays safe. So he has uh, 10... And nines on his attack value, so it's not going to be super hard to hit his mind control, especially because he has perplex on a lot of clicks. So I like him. I think with this set having so many armor and robots, uh, he's worth playing. And like I said, there's not a lot of good other uh, uncommon action uh, options. So yeah, who do you like for your number two? Um, I went with Centurious. Um, Centurious was a piece I didn't get to play. Um, I I like him though at seventy two points. Um, he has a special perplex where he can use it normally, where he can modify attack value plus two. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, 18 defenses are here and there in the set, and they're kind of hard to get to. It's nice to guarantee that attack in this set, because there are some nines and some eights at points on some figures here. Um, and he has a special attack ability where you, um, your characters can't be the target of opposing characters perplex. Um, with Hammer Industries in this set, that's a big thing, because... I had a few issues in some of my sealed games where people were using their hammer industries to actually weaken my attack, which could put my main character low enough. I was running just enough Count Nefaria. Um, they were weakening my attack down, and it was causing me a lot of problems, actually. Um, so I, I like him. He's not bad for 72 points. And then his last two clicks I particularly like because he drops on two Pinsai Outwit Invul, which um, late game having Invul is good. And late game having pin size, awesome. And then late game having um, six range outwit is great. Um, he's not a ter- he's not an amazing piece. He's just one of those useful pieces that I could see if I had a good spot and 72 points left to fill, I'd go with him. I pulled two of him in my sealed, and I ended up not playing either one of them because I didn't like him a whole lot. But his last two clicks are really good, and that perplex can be useful. So if you... If you don't have a lot of good options and you need to use them, he's not a bad piece to use. He has I'm, Thunderbolts, but that's not really usable in sealed. Right. I'm not sure who I would really use other on the uncommon slots. I do kind of like the Scarecrow for tie-up, and he has that Murder of Crows. Uh, he has Plasticity, Combat Reflexes, and Shape Change almost his entire dial. And he has a trait. Give him a power action if there are no Murder of Crows on the map. And place a Murder of Crows token in an adjacent square. That token becomes a bystander token as described on the back of the card. I like the Murder of Crows. So let's look at the Murder of Crows. It has flight, so it can carry. It also has poison, which is the main thing. And has the damage ability when it's hit with by an attack, any relic assigned to the hit character is placed in his square. So that's not going to help it in sealed. However, well, unless, you're pl- unless you're allowed to play with rings. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, good point. Uh, but yeah, mainly like- the fact that he's spitting out a guy who can carry your team and poison, and he, he also himself is shape change plasticity kind so, of reflex. I think I'm going to go with him for my number two, just for tie up factor. He was a close choice for me. Um, Who's your number three? Blizzard. Um, Blizzard was one I didn't really yeah, look at I too guess, much. I guess Blizzard does. There's, there's um, a real there isn't a lot of pulse wave in this set, really. Um, if there is, it's sprinkled down dial typically. Um, and trying to get around all those defense abilities, pulse wave is always useful. Um, he's 75 points as Masters of Evil, he has six range. Running shot, 9, pulse wave for 10 attack. He has a special defense ability with 17 defense. He can use barrier and energy shield deflection. When he uses barrier, you may place a hindering token in the square he occupies. So energy shield plus a hindering token in his square puts him at a 20, which is ridiculous in this Mm. set. He's only got a 2 damage, but what I would personally use him for is using him to get up in there and just spamming pulse wave pretty much. Because his special attack ability he picks up down dial is when when he uses pulse wave... Hit opposing character 75 points or less can't be moved or placed until your next turn, and you may give an action token to one hit character for 150 points or less. 
So he's a, he's the rare pulse wave figure where you don't want to go for one single guy. You want to go for as many guys in your yeah. pulse wave as you can get. Um, I, I really like him at 75 points. I mean, that's not bad. Um, let's see. He has Hammer Industries, of course, so you can pick up the Replex. Oh, I didn't notice he had Hammer Yeah, Industries. he has Mandarins, Minions, Masters of Evil. He has the Master of Evil TA and then Thunderbolts. Um, he's not bad. I mean, like, that's a three-range pulse wave. Close corridor maps. Get up in a, in a room and just start pulse wave, pulse wave. I am not totally sure who I'm going to pick for my last one. I think I'm going to go with Sasha Hammer. I kind of want to go with Controller, but I really... I have every time I look controller. at Controller, I just hate him more and more. I don't know why people think he's so good. He does have TK, and he has Mind Control, and he isn't dealt unavoidable damage from it with 8 range. I guess he is good, but he's so expensive. And his Slave Disc thing is just really crappy, so... I, I think I'm going to go with Sasha Hammer if you pick the right pieces for her. I agree. Uh, she has a trait when a friendly character named Crimson Cow, Mandarin, or Justin Hammer is next to her. They each get plus one attack. That's not going to happen a whole lot, but the other trait is when a character with a different name, the armor or robot keyword, and 150 points or less would be KO'd, you may roll a D6. On a 5 to 6, return that character to the map in her square. On a click number that's the same number of clicks from the starting line as she is, that character is now a friendly character, and Sasha Hammer is KO'd, so it gives your armor or robot a new life. Yeah. And, and on the right pieces, like Iron Man 2.0 or Detroit Steel... Suddenly bringing Detroit Steel back at full dial. That Detroit scary. Steel, who had Impervious in, uh, was 18. dishing out big damage the entire game, is back. And now you got to deal with that 18 Impervious again. Uh, it can be a real pain in the ass. She also has that wit herself and sidestep, so... And then she drops onto Stealth Mastermind Pensai. Well, I do think if you can pull the right piece with her, which isn't too hard because there are a ton of armor and uh, robots, she could be a really game, could be a good game changer. The team I would really like to pull with her would be her, Justin, Hammer, and Detroit Steel together. They'd all get Hammer Industries. She'd get plus one attack from him. She drops onto Pulse Wave on her second and third clicks. I like her for 90 points. Um, there weren't too many others. Like when I looked oh, at it, she, uh, oh. I, uh, I forgot Power Jar was uncommon. I was thinking he was rare. He does do good damage for only 55 points. I, again, I don't like his higher option. I think he's too expensive, but his cheaper option, he's a charge, uh, super strength with 3 damage, so 5, and then with the ATA being 11. So he's a 57-point piece that would hit for 5 with an 11 attack, oh, which terrific. is always I worth it. I mean, that. as a secondary attacker. So Power Driver on will mention too. The rare slot's really fun and has what I think is the best sealed piece in the set, but I'll let you go first. Um, I went with War Machine, the rare one, right out the gate. Um, I've talked before how I I don't necessarily agree with how high people are placing him in general. I think he's a great piece, but I don't think he's amazing. But in sealed, I really like him. Um, once again, he's one of those pieces, he's a good, He's you get your value out of him for 125 points straight out, I'm just going to say that. Um, he has shield TA, so when Jason gets one damage, he has Avengers, so he doesn't count towards action to action totals um, on movement. He has eight range. Um, he has an eleven movement, so six range running shot or six movement running shot. Eleven attack, four damage, and a seventeen invul. Um, he has a special trait called variable threat adaptation. At the beginning of the game, choose a standard choose a standard power. When opposing character attacking War Machine can use the power, modify its attack and damage values minus one for the attack. Now, the reason I really like that in Sealed particularly is because this allows you to pick one of his two big weaknesses in Sealed, Penetrating Psychic Blast or Exploit, and then um, all of a sudden that negative one attack and negative one damage really matters for him, um, trying to tear through his upper clicks. Uh, personally, I would push him onto his second click, um, maybe running shot him into position, then push him. Um, he goes onto Stealth, loses one attack, but he picks up RCE, three damage, um, you kind of hide him in stealth. You can sit RCE out at 8 range. Um, you could shield support someone else adjacent to you um, with an extra plus 1 range. I, I like him for 125 points. I like him a lot. I think he is an amazing piece, mainly because of his swing. Uh, he has a, what, a 14 square swing with yeah, a true. 6 running shot and an 8 range. And he... There's not really a horrible click on his dial, and he also gets late dial uh, running pulse shot wave. pulse wave, and he has eight clicks for 125 points. So I think 
uh, coupled with the trait that you're getting to pick after you see your opponent's pieces. So you, like you said, you pick the the ability that's going to give you the most the, the biggest most trouble. Defense, but, yeah, and then you use it. And so I I really think he is a good piece, and he is a good option for uh, the rare for 125 slot. points especially. The best sealed piece I think is Melter in yeah, the rare he's slot. He's on my list too. He's 86 points. And as I was saying earlier, he has a lot... Uh, in this set, there's a l- big problem dealing with dampeners. He has not only for the fact that he has a 10 attack psychic blast with 6 range and 3 damage, he also has a special... Uh, first of all, he uh, busts through blocking terrain on improved targeting blocking terrain. But he also has molten armor ability, which when he targets a character with armor, robot, or vehicle, modify his attack and damage plus 1. And if he hits, he can use outwit until your next turn on the target, uh, only to target the hit character. Just the attack and damage alone was good, but when you get outwit on top of that, and it's a defensive outwit typically because it comes after, kind of. The pieces in this set that have the big dampeners are the armor and robots. Yeah. So you're going to be hitting them for an 11 and 4, three turns in a row with Masters of Evil. Or two, the, the I guess the third one would be uh, 11 and and three, but still, that's a lot of penetrating damage to dish out in this set because he has a Masters of Evil team ability. So if you can get him in a good position, he can just keep on blasting everybody. Yep. And he drops on a pulse wave. Uh, for his points, I think he's extremely good. And then yeah, you bust him for three or four damage, which would be about the average, and you'll hit him right on the pulse wave. So I love him. Uh, I really wish I would have pulled him in my sealed. Who's your number two? Um, Crimson Cal. Um, for set fifty-seven points, you have a TK Air. With a good 11 teleport, um, 16 defense energy shield, and a special defense ability. Crimson Cow can use leadership as if she had a point value of 150. So alone right there, she can clear off 150 or less and she's a 57 point. That's great in this set. Because most of the big pieces you're playing are 150 or less. Um, when she doesn't succeed, she may also remove an action token from adjacent character that shares a keyword with her regardless of point cost. Oh, Hunter, what's that keyword she has there? Hammer Industries. Once and again, Masters of Evil, which are also a lot of in the set. Yeah. But once again, you have another good character that if you have the ATA, extremely increases their playability. A TK piece in this set gives you a little bit of a pacing step up over your opponent, especially in combo with, once again, Detroit Steel. You TK Detroit Steel out. All of a sudden, you have one action up on your opponent. You have perplexes to use from her. Um, and she can leadership him because up to 150... And she can also remove an action token from adjacent character. So she can remove two action tokens from him. And he has Indom. I mean, like, she's one of those pieces that there's a few few really good pieces with her. And then there's some really, really good pieces with her. I like her for 57 points. I mean, like, I think about her in constructed teams. Yeah, I also was going to choose her for my number two. So since you took her, I'm going to go with Ironmonger 2.0. He... Is 135 points with Hammer Industries and a really cool trait, which will be really good and constructed. When a friendly character is KO'd by an opponent's attack, you may deal one penetrating damage to each opposing character adjacent to that character. He also has Running Shot with a 11 attack and a 4 damage and a special damage power. An opposing, If an opposing character within range and line of fire can use Outwit or Perp, he can use that power until your next turn and this can't be countered. He has seven range, so he's a little bit longer range on his outwit and perp than most pieces. And then he has that perp from the ATA as well. And then his next two clicks, if you decide to push him, if you need the Psychic Blast, you have the option of pushing him onto Psychic Blast. I really like him. I do too. Um, Hammer Industries on top of that. I had a lot of trouble playing against him in Sealed. And uh, I think he uh, that, in, along with the trait, is, is really nasty. And I really love two clicks of regen down dial like that. With poison on top oh, yeah. of it. So, what is your number three? Um, you chose my melter. Um, but if I really had to, I'm probably going to go with the uh, rare Iron Man. Um, he's a really good piece. Um, he's 110 points. He has a trait when it's not your turn, lines of fire can't be drawn to him if he occupies hindering or is adjacent to blocking. So, it's kind of like the hand ATA meets stealth. Um, he basically just avoids everything. Um, the Ancestral Spirit you're probably not going get to get get to use unless you pull a chase and it just happens to be sitting in your sideboard you don't want to play it. Um, but his damage ability is he can use Shape Change. When he does and the result is 1, he can't use Shape Change this game, but he can use Willpower instead. So, he's a 17 in Vol on top click, 
7 range, 11, da 11 attack energy explosion. The two bolts. With two bolts, which, two bolt energy explosion, well, I don't think we've seen yet, really. Detroit Steel only had one. Yeah. Um, and then a uh, shape change on top of that. He doesn't have willpower unless he fails to shape change massively, and he doesn't have move and attack. But the fact that he can sit and avoid lines of fire so easily, I feel like if you played him smart and you had a, a few other pieces that were kind of drawing enemy fire, mm -hmm. and you set him up, your opponent just won't see him coming, and he'll just blast him. I agree. He was actually going to be my next pick. I, <laughs> I barely picked on Monger over him. I, uh, I have a... I was gonna, Well, go ahead and pick yours. I was going to say I have a, a choice that I would do if I pulled certain things. I'm going to go Shaman. I think for sealed, he's re actually he's really good for constructed too. There's a lot of flight pieces. In he's this set 92 too. points. Yeah, he takes away flight from everybody well, else. An SR. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, in, he's in my next slot. Um, let's see. Who do I want my other one to be? Um, I probably I think I'm gonna go with Death's Head. He was the one I was gonna pick for my. Particularly if I pulled other things. But. He's 177 points, so he's pretty expensive, but he has a massive range with 8 range. And improved targeting ignores characters, so that's that's friendly and opposing. He starts off on Psychic Blast 4 damage. First of all, he's, his damage output is insane. And for his first four, first four clicks, I have trouble speaking. It's because I had a root canal yesterday and a bunch of other stuff last week. So if I stutter and stuff, it's because <laughs> my mouth is all jacked up. But... For his first four clicks, he has either Psychic Blast or Exploit Weakness. And later in his dial, basically mid-dial, he gets a, a really good attack ability called Side Job. Each time he hits with an attack in Actions Resolve, you may deal one unavoidable to another friendly character within three squares. It'd be nice if you pulled a Magia Goon or two with him. No, 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 there's a particular piece that I'll get to. If you do, Death's Head may be given one action as a free action but can't attack a target he already attacked. So that one action can be a, another Psychic Blast or another Exploit Weakness. Yeah, if you were fighting, let's say, an Iron Monger and a Crimson... Or not a Crimson, a uh, um, Detroit Steel and wanted to blast them both for four. Yeah, for that would have been nice if I would have pulled this out. Now, the combo... The combo I was going to... Well, go ahead with his damage. That's right. go, go ahead. Say combo. The combo I like with him, which was a character that almost made my commons list, was Dreadnought. Um, Dreadnought actually can... Uh, heal other dreadnoughts. Um, let's see. I think it's their ability is two damage to another person with robot um, if they take one. Um, donate parts. Okay, so dreadnoughts themselves are fifty points. They're common. They have five range. They're giant, but they have stealth. Um, they have empower and toughness on their top click. They push onto blades empower, and their third click they pick up a damage power. Give give Dreadnought a power action. Heal an adjacent friendly character with Robot two clicks, and then deal one unavoidable damage to Dreadnought. So you trade one damage on them for two healing on another. Then they drop onto Regen down dial. Death's Head, however, can keep popping. You can have two of these guys with Hydra sitting there, Hydraing down opponents, and then they're sitting there hitting, or then Death's Head's just like, I'm going to pop you for one to take another shot. I'm going to pop you for one. And they're just constantly healing each other back and forth. I mean, like... It's a great little bit, and I think... Does Death's Head have a robot? Yeah. So they could heal him, too, if they really wanted to. Yeah, that's what I thought you were getting at. Oh, no, that, um, that too. I didn't know if he had a robot It wouldn't be a bad idea, because he has Invincible for three clicks in the middle there, and he has Dampeners this whole dial. And once again, they drop onto Regen down dial, so they can just heal right back up when they're done. He has a special damage power for his last four clicks in conjunction with Sidestep. At the beginning of your, your turn, choose... CCE or RCE, he can use that power this turn. Yeah, and choice if that's ridiculous. And then on his last two clicks, he has Invul and Regen, so he, he still is protected while he needs to Regen. On he three was so clicks. close to making my list. Like it was, I was really torn. Um, I like Melter a lot, and I really think Melter's good. The only real huge problem I have with Melter is that if your opponent happens to be running one of the pieces that doesn't have armor or robot... He is substantially weaker, but having that pin side is still really worth it. So for our last, uh, we're going to lump in super rares, primes, and chases into one section, which we'll just call the special section. The ones that are hard to pull, um, but we want to mention our like top three. Well, let's. you want to go top five? Well, let's see. How many would that be? Let's see. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five. Five and then ten, fifteen. Let's go top four each. That way it'll be eight right. total. 
I'll let you go first. So it can be either a Super Rare Prime or Chase. Out of all these Super Rare Primes, Chases, who's the best or sealed? I want to say Grey Gargoyle. Um, there's a lot of good common in caps in the set that combo really well with him, especially that rescue. Um, he himself is a monster to deal with. Um, we saw a team in our sealed tournament that took, I think, first place, didn't it? Yeah, but it also had a rescue and a... Uh... <laughs> Uh, basically every single figure we've listed it had on its team. But you, if you go with, if you're going with, like, you pointed out Scarecrow kind of as, like, Scarecrow's almost, like, what, a 90 point? He's 70. Or he's 70 points. Something. So for a 20 point upgrade, you're looking at a character with plasticity, a special in cap where he may give up to two action tokens to a hit character. Um, he has zero range, though, so it has to be a melee in cap. And then down, um, after you push him once he picks up a damage power where he deals penetrating car- damage to characters with <coughs> two tokens. But his trait is what makes him really good. When an adjacent opposing character would clear tokens, that character clears only one token instead of two. Which is really good for 95 points. Mm-hmm. Like, if I played him, like, in this set, I feel like the typical point breakdown you kind of run into is you typically have a 125 to 150 point character... A 50-point-ish support piece, and then, like, something little less than 100 to fill out that last gap. Like, I feel like most of the time when I look at pieces, like, down rarity schemes, that's about what it looks like. Um, I feel like he would fill in that last gap good. He's not a bad secondary attacker. He actually picks up super strength of a 4 damage and invul in mid-dial. Um, and for 95 points, he does great damage, great in cap, and that trait is just ridiculous. I mean, like, I, I love him. For ni- for ninety five, like I really want him. I was trying to think. That team had I remember it had Great Garo, Crimson Cow, Freak, and Rescue on it, and it had somebody else really good, but I can't remember who for the life of me it was. But it was like I was like, you have like four of the best ten sealed pieces <laughs> on your team. He ended up winning. Um, for mine, I do agree. I do, I do think that's that's definitely one of the best, if not the best, out of this section. Uh, I'm but I for sealed. I'm actually going to go with King Hyperion, um, or or work. actually either the or. Prime. I guess you can't really go wrong either way. I think I'm going to go with King. Does King? Yeah, King has willpower. Uh, just because he has two starting clicks of Hypersonic, and he has Impervious, and if you happen to pull a Magiagoon with him, you should not lose. Harry. You really, unless you miss like four pulls. Yeah, unless you have horrible um, luck, but. The fact that he has a 12 hypersonic with an 8 range so he could shoot for 4 if he wanted to do the shooting option and stay safer. I think unless you're playing against... I don't even know what could really take him down reliably. Um, hypersonic of this magnitude and sealed is just stupid strong. He's got a... He does cost 266 points, which is a lot, but he has a 12 hypersonic, 12 attack, super strength, 18 impervious, and 5 damage. He is a one-man army. Top click, so... He's going to be really tough to play against in a sealed environment, along with the Prime Hyperion, but who's your next one? Um, I actually like Absorbing Man Titania. If we're going to be talking one-man armies that I think could dish out some serious, serious damage, um, I'm going to go with Absorbing Man Titania at 250. Um, they have... That 250 leaves you a gap. I mean, there's not too many 50 pointer less figures you can fill it in with, but you could, you could take Wrecking Crew ATA on them. Um, you're looking at a piece that is, it's a monster. I mean, like, when they first spoiled this, we talked about it. In Constructed, there's some teams I've looked at playing with it for fun. Um, they ignore hindering and, hindering on characters. Um, when they KO an opposing character, roll a D6. On a 3 to, on a 3 to 6, you place a light object in the square. On a 5 to 6, place a heavy instead. Um, they have another trait. They can use plasticity and super strength. Plasticity and super strength alone right there is great because that keeps pieces like Hyperion or anyone with Hypersonic from getting up on you. And then running away. Um, they may pick up and hold up to two objects and may choose how many to use during each attack. So they could hold objects and be like, oh, I'm going to kill this little person real quick mm-hmm. and then not bother to waste it. And they can use both and hit you for three damage extra Yeah, on top because it says zero. Or you could pick or up two heavies and do plus two on the first attack, plus two on the second when they do. Mm-hmm. Um, you're looking at an attack ability that's a free action to place a standard object on the map into an adjacent square, so they just get any object they want. Yep. Um, they have a damage power where they can use Blades, Claws, Fangs, and Close Combat Expert down dial. 
with um, their duo. With attack. their duo attack, they use one during the first and one during the second. They have Masters of Evil, which the thing I did learn during Sealed the few times I ran into Masters of Evil was it actually does throw it throws the pacing for a loop if you're not expecting it. Um, times that I thought I kind of had the edge with how I had set everything up, um, I would forget he would have Masters of Evil or something. He t- he'd take that push to just slap me, and I'm like, crap, I didn't expect that. Um, and a piece like this being able to just turn after turn tear into them, and they don't drop bad really at all. I mean, they lose Close Combat Expert and Imperv, so I don't know if I would personally... Well, they don't lose Close Combat Expert because they get it on their damage power. Oh, yeah, true. So all they really lose is their defense abilities drop. And then they bit. get invincible like halfway through their dial. And then too. they have uh, three clicks of regen down dial. I mean, like, they're a monster. Um, for 250 points, I feel like you could really tear up the map with this piece. Um, I would have no problem if I pulled them playing them solo and sealed, even if I didn't have anything to fill it out. I'm going Count Nefaria. I played it. Because you played him, and <laughs> He's I already knew he was really stupid, and I made you play him for that reason. <laughs> Um, he has, first of all, and this guy's going to be a meta piece too, mark my words right now. He has hypersonic, and he's 11 clicks long, but the main reason why I think he'll be a potential meta piece, let alone the hypersonic and the invincible on top click, is his trait. Once per game, give him a free action until your next turn, he ignores all damage dealt to him by opposing characters' attacks unless it's a crit hit. No one's going to risk for that crit. So you're going to get the alpha in and prevent them from getting the alpha in, and you're going to hit him again before he has to push. And even when you do smoke this son of a gun, he goes on to this last three clicks of Invul and uh, Steel Energy and Charge and Flurry. And he reduces damage dealt to him by close combat attacks by three instead of two, unless it's a crit hit. And then mid-dial, he has that damage power where he has willpower and he can't be count. Yeah, and his other powers can't I be I think counted. he, along with the Absorbing Man Titania you were just talking about, are two amazing gauntlet targets. Oh, yeah. This guy with Steel Energy full dial and the ability to completely negate the first big attack that comes at him to let him get even farther down his uh, gauntlet you know, spin the gauntlet even more. He's really, really good. Yeah, I think overall Invincible brought back the gauntlet. Like, that that defense power is just so good for gauntlet. I mean, you get the opportunity to heal back up there somehow, either by popping somebody and healing one from Steel Energy and also killing them for plus two, Mm -hmm. healing you back onto Invincible, and your opponent has to hit you with a major attack again. I mean, like, it's just monstrous. I'm going Count Nefaria. Who's your number three? That was actually my number three. Well, pick again. Um, Let's see, we're picking top four. Um, Silver Centurion, why not? I was kind of... Oh, I can't believe I forgot about him, dang it. God, this piece, I don't even, I'm not even going to explain the reason, we've talked about him and how ridiculous he is. Um, he sets the pace, especially in Sealed. Um, having him on the other side of the board, he stops Pulse Wave, Pinsai, and Poison. Hey Hunter, what did we sit here talking about that was great for stopping dampeners in this set? Pulse Wave, Pinsai, and Poison. He's a shape change... He's a shape change imperv, which is hard enough to hit. He's a 161 armor. Um, he's just ridiculous. And he's only the common prime. I mean, like, you'll see at least one of them out of, like, 20 people playing, probably. Oh, if there's that many people playing, you definitely will. Um, he is another very potential meta. Actually, I can... He is a meta. I, just, I can go ahead and the guarantee world... you, you will see some of this guy. Yeah, there were world champs already talking about how good he is. So... Get a, get your hands on this guy. He's really stupidly good and constructed, especially in sealed when dealing with his little token thing is nigh uh, uh, impossible. Uh, I'm going to pick another Prime as my number three as well, and I'm going to go with the War Machine Prime. That was my number four. For sealed, <laughs> for sealed, his double power action thing is just too good. Um, it's so good that my brain initially read it and was like, well, surely that's only once per game. <laughs> no, he can just keep doing it. Uh, you give him a double power action, give him two different actions, that's three actions, whatever he wants. He has a huge swing with an 11 running shot, 8 range, 2 bolts, 11 attack, sharpshooter, and 5 damage, so he's just dealing massive amounts of damage. He has 10 clicks. This is one of those pieces I think could take King Hyperion toe-to-toe. Mm. He's got some pulse wave, he's got uh, with a, a good... With a good hit on Impervious maybe the first time, yeah. Yeah. I think there's no reason Hyperion, the intelligent... Uh, placing shouldn't get the first hit though. Yeah, with hypersonic. That's true. But yeah, he is just stupid good. And then he has his, 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 as if his dial is not enough. He has a stupid trait. 
Each time he is targeted with an attack, you put a retaliation token on his card. Give him a free action, remove two tokens, and he can make a ranged combat attack against a single target. So you don't even have to hit him. That's just targeted. You just you just have to target him and try to hit him, whether you miss him completely or he hits impervious, or even if you do hit him and damage him, he still gets tokens. Also, you play this guy in conjunction with the Tony Stark who mind controls. Yeah, if and every time more it, than three hundred and sealed. I'm just saying it constructed. Every uh, time you use Tony and you mind control this guy, granted you can't give him the double power action thing because it's mind control, but he's gonna get retaliation tokens. The only thing... Because he's targeted by an attack. It doesn't say opposing. Yeah. Is under the new rules, he does get a little bit weaker because he gets minus one damage on his second attack. Correct. And the mind control won't be as effective. But he's still... Ten clicks, he's a monster. All right. <clears throat> Last chance, Austin. Who you like Hold for Hold on, let me four? see. This. I'm going to have to look through these chases because there's one I'm thinking of. It is I, probably the Pharaoh. It is the Pharaoh. Yeah, I like him too. Um... All the all the chases I want to say are tolerable. Some of them more so than others in sealed. Um, whether it comes to actually really good in sealed, um, I'm gonna go with Iron Pharaoh. Iron Pharaoh is 110 points. Um, he doesn't have move and attack, and he starts without wit. He has the same trait that all of them have, though, which is he modifies his attack and damage plus one when targeting a character that shares a keyword with him. Now look at his keywords here, Hunter: armor, mystical, ruler, and past. He there is gonna be an art. I mean, Count Nefaria was, like, the only character I can think of that was, like, a big heavy piece that didn't have armor. He had Mystical instead. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, he this guy covers all the grounds there, so you might as well be playing him like he's an 11-4. Um, and then he has a special Falcon token. When it, uh, when he's first placed on the map, you place a special terrain marker in adjacent square. That means it can't be destroyed or anything. Give him a free action to move that up to three squares. He can draw lines of fire and count range up to three squares from the Falcon marker using improved targeting, ignoring basically everything. So what you do is you keep him back in your starting area and you use that Falcon as like your eyes kind of to set everything up. Um, he's 110 points, so he's a, he's a chunkier force. Um, and he's got a special attack power he picks up on a second click. He can use my control but only to target characters of fewer points than, insel than himself. When he does deal one unavoidable damage to the character he hit with his mind control. Um, I like him. He's not... I wouldn't say he's like as ridiculous as like King Hyperion or somebody. But for 110 points, if I pulled this chase, I'd give him a run. I mean, like... And then bottom dial, he picks up an 11 attack uh, probability control Pinsai. He, he's not a bad piece, especially if you take full advantage of that Falcon and you manage to use it. Um, definitely could have some fun with him. I really like him, too. I've... Played against him a couple times. What what's you up? know, what he'd be really good with actually. Now that I think about it, rings. Um, there's a lot of rings that could really increase his capabilities. Um, well, a lot of figures are better with rings, but I mean, if you gave him Pinsai all the time, for instance, with that one ring that has energy explosion, Pinsai. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot. Almost any ring would go good on him, actually. I like him a lot because of his nine range. And oh, I didn't even notice he had nine range. The Falcon token that sees through basically everything if you draw your line of fire from it. However, it can only you can only draw range up to three if you're using it. But it ignores hindering, elevated, outdoor blocking, and characters. Yeah, so that's that's everything but yeah. indoor blocking. And but the thing is that he's a great. I don't want to say amazing one ten support piece, even if you ignore his attack capabilities. But you could draw a wit from there. I mean, since it ignores all that, you could get rid of that one stealth piece who's annoying you, like whoever it could be in the set. It could be that second-click war machine who's hiding out in stealth at the back. You could draw out wit, outwit his stealth, and then your main attacker who took up the rest of your points can just blast him. I mean, like, I like him. He's he's a fun piece. He's got a cool mechanic. Um, and just overall, that mind control is also awesome. I mean, like, um, you just pick some one of their weak support pieces or somebody or Aurora... Aurora gives negative two attack to somebody she slaps. Take their Aurora, smack their main figure with them. Aurora takes the damage and their figure's negative two attack till next turn. For my last one, I'm going to take the easy way out and just say the Prime <laughs> Hyperion. But it's also because he really is that good. He has a uh, hypersonic power cosmic, first of all. Eight range as well. He has 13 hypersonic, 12 attack super strength, and five damage leadership. 19 and purpose, so he's a little bit harder to hit. And but his second click for the next three, he goes on a charge. But then he again gets two clicks of um, uh, hypersonic, 
and he has two different point values. So you can play him at 200, oh, yeah. where he also starts with hypersonic, but he has precision strike and he has invul instead of impervious. Then he gets a special, later in his dog, a special damage ability. He gets improved targeting, ignores hindering, elevated blocking. Uh, it, yeah, hindering, elevated blocking. When a ranged combat attack resolves, any blocking terrain along fire is destroyed. He ignores characters if he targets a character with an action token. So yeah. only if they've already done something. Which we talked about when we spoiled him is really cool because it's like you kind of hear them. Yeah. He has super hearing like Superman. So um, I think at either point option he's really having good. Having played against him in normal constructed he's a monster. So I mean I can't imagine if he was also um, in sealed. Um, the one piece I didn't look at enough and I wish I really had was Titanium Man. Um, I haven't had a chance to really go over him to see how good he would be in sealed at, especially at his half dial, because he gets the bouncing attack, doesn't he? He has, a, well, for his damage ability is his bouncing attack, which is at the higher point, at the 250 version. It, he draws a direct line of fire to an opposing character for a ranged combat attack. The AoE for that attack includes opposing characters occupying a square along that line of fire between him and the target. Divide damage among all hit uh, it, that we should note with that he ignores characters on targeting and he's a giant too so that. he can if you have your guys in a straight line he can go up to square, eight squares away shooting at all eight of at all of them along that eight square line and then split up his damage among them after he hits and, then, and he increases the damage dealt to each hit character by plus one but see I like his half dial too though because he picks up that special super strength that's really good um, you, you've shown off like some of the wrecking crew today but that that def- or that uh, attack ability, there's not really too many options outside the Wrecking Crew to really take full advantage of Super Strength. Um, he's a great piece for it because when he uses, he can use Super Strength, and when he uses an object, he gets plus one damage, and the hit character gets an action token. So I mean, like, how many points is he at half dial? Is it one fifty or one seventy five? Uh, he's 250 at full and one fifty at. Short. I re- at one fifty, he's a really really short dial. But I think if you took somebody by surprise with that attack ability and just smashed them with it, he's also 8 range, ignores hindering and characters on attacking. Um, he's not bad. Um, he's another one I'd probably pick. Um, I'd almost pick him over Iron Pharaoh for the more likely to run into scenario. Yeah. So that is going to be it for the individual pieces. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this set overall as a sealed set? Um... I know I've said this a lot. This is probably my favorite sealed set we've played so far. Um, I think when you play with the rings and the ATAs, there's so many strategies. There's so much synergy between pieces and combos. Um, It was really fun, and I felt like, to a point, it's the kind of set that the player skill matters a lot in sealed. It's less what you pull and more so how you play it. I. It's definitely not my favorite, but it definitely is a good sealed set. I still like Spidey a lot better. Oh, yeah, Sam was fun. And uh, I liked Wolverine a lot, too. But I think Iron Man is a lot better sealed set than I had initially kind of expected it to be. And it is really fun to... It's just so many of these characters have very specific mechanics that are all really good. I mean, there's not really any very many horrible pieces in this set. And a lot of the good ones, like the common slot was the most... The common slot was the hardest one to pick from. Yeah, Yeah, it was chock full of good characters and good figures. So, And these super rares are powerhouses. And with the distribution on this set, as long as you don't get a really crappy brick that are floating around, I mean, you're going to get probably a super rare. And see, and that's what I was going to say about it. Um, I like the way they set it up where it seems like the common slot are, of course, all your cheap support pieces... The uncommon, you get some of your tertiary, cheaper attackers. And then in the rares, you get some heavier attackers. And then the super rares are these big, beefy, full team and a character kind of characters. Uh, and I, I like that setup, really, the way it all it all filled out. I will say this. If you if you get to play the sealed with rings and with ATAs, it's better than X-Men. And it rivals Spidey. Yeah, you, you uh, definitely... It really makes it a lot more fun. Especially when you consider like how much the rings kind of... It, it's pretty easy to pull a ring and seal it too. And there's so many different options on those rings. You can completely change how you play your team if you pick up that ring or not. Overall, as a set, uh, I like it a lot more... Again, I like it a lot more than I thought I would. Exactly. Um, I... 
there's a lot of pieces that I'm going to have to buy on the secondary market that I really didn't expect to hardly get. I thought I would get maybe like a dozen figures out of this set for now and then later kind of slowly trade for them. But there's already like a, a few pieces that I have to get in my hands as soon as possible. I finally got a King Hyperion. I really, really need to get a Silver Centurion. Like I really need to get that Duo Iron Man War Machine. So, you know, I did not think that would be the case when we initially went into Iron Man. Me neither. I honestly, like, I started out hyped for the set. When everything was spoiled, I was a little eh. Now that I've had my hands on it and gotten to play with some of these pieces, um, the thing I kind of like about the pieces is at a glance, you kind of think they're not that great. But once you get a chance to play them and kind of really use their abilities to their full power, um, it completely changes your perspective of them. Let's move into the community section. Uh, this qu week's question was, what is your favorite comic book event of all time? And I'm not totally sure what I think yours would be. I am going to guess Civil War, but I'm not for sure. Me? You. I thought Civil War was Old Testament with Cap as Jesus and what? Iron Man as, or and Tony Stark as freaking Judas slash Pharisees, but no, I didn't like Civil I, I, I shouldn't say I didn't like Civil War. Civil War was okay to me. I just figured because it features your main man, Tony Stark, that you yeah. would like it so much. Um, Gosh, it's, it's a hard one, really. Honestly, I might go with a DC one here and say Forever Evil. Well, that wasn't really... It was an event. An event? No, well, yeah, I guess, kind of. Um, um, if you include all the villain books and everything as one big thing, I think overall it was I liked it a lot. There was a lot of good character development where I could read about side characters. All right, I'll let you use it. Okay. I'll give it to you. You can have it. I'm gonna go Infinity. Um, I I did have high expectations going into it with it being Hickman and with it being Cosmic Marvel, which I love, and it. It met all those expectations and kind of exceeded them too, and I really thought it would be really hard for a event book to top Civil War for me. I also really liked House of M and um, Christ on Infinite Earth it's from been a DC. Long time since I've read House of M. So and Blackest Night's really good too. So I really it really says something that Infinity is my favorite event. And it's not just because I'm a cosmic Marvel fanboy. It's it's also because it really is. An extremely well constructed event, especially if you dive into all the backstory and, and hidden things behind it. It's really well written, a lot of big stuff happens. You're probably not going to see that ever happen again. All of the different races working together, actually, I can pretty much guarantee you, you're not going to see it again. What were you going to say, Austin? Uh, if, if you're going to make me pick an actual event event, I would say I did like Rise of the First Lantern a lot. Um, not as much as Blackest Night, but I did really enjoy it overall. Um, only just to avoid picking probably the same kind of... You mentioned how much Blackest Night was good, and I completely forgot about the Green Lantern events. There was a huge uh, variance on the answers we got from people. There was not a clear winner whatsoever. That's pretty nice, actually. I would... If I had to sit and count them, I think Civil War may have very slightly gotten the lead. But, I mean, I saw basically every comic event that's ever been... <laughs> that's ever been created listed, so we had a great... Uh, Great variance on the answers. Moving on to dial design, week one ended, and the top dial was very close. There uh, were a lot of... I had a hard time choosing, but... Damn it, Swagnito. I'm just going to say now, I'm I'm ticked at you. You always have to pick my favorite characters. Well, Gosh. not only that, it's a really... It was a really good dial. It's a really cool idea. It's very extremely creative, and... It's not a character you'd expect to see in clicks. The The... Um, the the assignment was for deity, and Swag went with Hephaestus. He is 100 points. Uh, if you just want to play his first four clicks, he's 160 points if you want to play his full dial. The difference is his 160 dial has some uh, attack capabilities, whereas his 100-point option does not. And it picks up his defense and movement power, too. His... Special attack, well, let's go with his, uh, his improved movement, uh, ignores hindering, destroys blocking. His trait, he cannot be carried or placed. His speed value can't be modified by other characters. Uh, so that is important to note because a couple things. The combination of destroying blocking when he moves and the fact that there's no way to buff his movement range, those things help balance the character. Because 
the next trait is when you build your team, you can't use any resources, relics, or objects. When he destroys a wall or square of blocking terrain, place a light object in a square adjacent to a resulting debris marker. So he drops objects when he moves through them and busts through them. But he, can, he has very short movement, sixes at the most. So he moves through, busts up, makes his own resources fall down, and then he can use his attack power. He can use super strength. You give him a free action and remove an adjacent object from the game. Then choose an adjacent friendly character that has not already been chosen for this power. Modify one of that character's combat values by plus two, and they can use super strength if they can't already. So, they can pick up an object that he's already busted a wall out for. You modify whatever value they need, so you give them a shield, you give them plus two defense, you give them a better sword, they get plus two attack, you know, whatever. Um, you can give them range, you know, movement, whatever they need. That's really representative of Hephaestus. He helps us, the rest of the gods out by forging things. Uh, he balances it well by not letting you have other objects and other resources and relics on your team to stack on top of this. I think it's really good. He's well costed. If he was a whole lot of points, you wouldn't want to play him because, you know, what he provides, you wouldn't be able to put much of a team together with him to be able to benefit from what he's providing. Uh, and he, if he was much cheaper, he would be a little bit too good for his points. So See, I think he's well costed as well. I like him at 100 because he's a support piece, but I like him at 160 because he picks up all those warrior clicks with his special defense and special movement. So if you play him at 160, his first four clicks are the forging weapons. The last four or five clicks are basically attack. Uh, he gets hypersonic with short movement values. He gets... Plus one speed for each wall or square blocking terrain he has already destroyed this game, so that helps him. So you start out and you're kind of hobbling through walls, and then all of a sudden you're plus three movement down dial. Cause he has a defense power. When he's when his power is revealed due to damage dealt from opposing character, stop turning the dial. He can use invincible and reflexes, and he's at an 18 with a perplex, so he could go up to a 21 if you wanted to play defensively with him. I he also Then he goes on to impervious and two clicks of invul. Dishes out good attacking damage values for an extra... And perplexes all down. And that's only an extra 60 points. So I'm not sure why you wouldn't play him, honestly. I like him. I mean, like, honestly, he's one of... As I said, he's one of my favorite characters. He was the surprise character. Now, I've always liked Hephaestus as a Greek god. Like, among all the Greek gods, he was always my favorite. Then when I was reading Wonder Woman and they run into him, I was like, oh, buddy. And then I ended up loving him in those books. Yeah. So Wonder here. Woman is my favorite DC book, even more than Batman, which is really saying something. Yeah. So, Good so, job, Swaggy Douche. So congrats once again <laughs> to Swaggy you know, for getting the best score. It was very close. He's only one point higher than, like, three other people. We're Gosh. tied at 27. I liked the, uh, was it a Nero or whatever that had the uh, Candelabra token? Yeah, that was uh, Batarang's. Uh, dial this week. Yeah, I really like that one too. Um, he always does well. I really like the Azazel, but you and Drew didn't like it as much as I did, but I loved it. I thought it was extremely representative of the character. I thought he a, did a great job balancing it because it's he's extremely hard to hit. He gets a lot of strikes in with his abilities that he has, but he doesn't deal much damage, so it kind of evens out. That's true. Um, he... I might have been overly harsh on that one. The only thing I didn't like on him was Indom, but I can overlook that. I mean, people give Indom to everything. But uh, I but thought yeah, that was a really like fun a battle, salad, too. Though. Yeah, I guess. Uh, this week's assignment I just gave out today on the thread. So For those of you who haven't been on it yet and who participate, my assignment was to build a character who has the morph ability, and that could be a brand spanking new character who has never had a morph ability. Um, what I mean by morph is the same power that's similar to Beast Boy or Ant-Man or the Spidey Chases where they can change armor so you could do you know, you know, do an armor piece like an Iron Man. Some sort of Iron Man that changes armors like they should have done in the Invincible Iron Man. So. Yeah. Uh, you can do a figure who already has a morph and you can make a new one for it like a Beast Boy. You can make more iterations for a Beast Boy. You could make uh, a brand new character who's never had one like we already have a mystique on there who has a morph yeah. ability can move from more from different mutants which is really cool so things like that you got a lot of options any comic yeah. universe is fine as long as it's comic based so like i said marvel dc vertigo image etc as long as it's comic and, and not morphs like are really game. morphs are really really open ability you can do a lot of stuff i just thought that would be a really full uh, really fun really cool one and we also haven't 
um, done anything like that where you have to use like a specific ability yeah. really yet. So I thought that'd be a real fun one to do. And I also love Morph and love Beast Boy, so it's one of my favorite abilities in the Morph's game. Morph's probably my favorite ability. I wrote a whole article on that on HC Realms. Actually, I really wanted to do Minion. Uh, and I think I'm going to do that next month, so we'll see. Um, that's it for Dial Design Best Build Contest. If you guys haven't submitted, you have one. Yeah, I have like four or five days left. The assignment: if if no one knows how Best Build works, uh, we give you a build assignment. You build us a team that fits within those parameters, and then Drew Austin and I will play it at and an event coming deck. up at the dugout in a live tournament setting with other players. And whichever one of we each pick a team, we look through all the teams, we see who gets to go first, you know, first picks first, second picks second, third picks third, and then we play, and then whichever of us scores the best, the the per the member of you guys whoever of you guys submitted that team wins the prize. So we've had I think Drew won twice, I won once, Austin hasn't won yet, but he's due me and Drew tied and it was a roll off. That doesn't count. He's due for one. So we'll see how he does this time. Three men go out and two disappointments come back. The assignment this week is 300 point modern, and this is our Christmas event. So it's going to be, there's a little more random factor in this one than there is in some of the other ones, but it's because it's a Christmas event. It's 300 points modern age. Every figure on your team must either be all red or all green, and that is sculpt. That includes the sculpt and the base that they're on. So I've already approved Hulk chases, Spider-Man chases, Iron Man chases, Holiday Elf, all the ones that are red or green. Um, and if you're looking at a figure and you're thinking, hmm, it, it does this qualify or does it not? My whole thing is look at it and think to yourself, does 50% or more of it involve that color? If it does, you're good. Um, for example, if you're looking at your AVX packs, uh, Magneto has enough red on him to qualify. He's half or more red. Yeah. He would be approved. Thor is the same way. Even though most of Thor is black and silver, his cape takes up quite a bit of his sculpt. I would even give him a pass on the red team. So most of your figures need to be either red or green. 300 points, modern age. It's going to be figures only. No extra anything. ATAs, relics, resources, etc. The other caveat to this is before the matches begin, I have 20 random relics. Some of them are really good, some of them are really bad. Uh, game effects, there's a plus two to all relic rolls. And before each round, I randomly decide with the number generator which relic you get assigned to your team and you get to place that relic on the map. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. So Hunter's a terrible person. If you're Austin, you get, like, you get no, amazing uh, uh, Mandarin rings every turn. And if you're Hunter, you get a uh, rebreather on an all plant map, uh, hindering map. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, I think it'll be fun. It's, it'll definitely it's be fun. It's a really cool idea, and I'm excited to test it out. If it works really well, I'm going to spread the spread the word around so other people can try it. We don't get to play with relics enough. We play with resources too much. True. Well, that goes for everywhere these days with yeah. clicks. Uh, YouTube-wise, I've been putting the episodes up. Uh, 1 through 5 are done. 6 through 10 will be going up probably tomorrow. I also just did a Smog, a Desolation of Smog starter set review, and that was an in-depth review like the Mage Knight. I went through every figure, reviewed it, gave it a score in Silver Age, gave it a score in uh, Lord of the Rings only, talked about what makes it good in each, what makes it bad in each. I'm going to have to watch that. I also gave you a look at the maps. you got to see these maps, Austin. I do. This is the best set of maps that any set or from anything has ever came out with. Um, the map there's three double sided maps in it too, so that's a lot. I really like that. I really like that starter set anyway because it has some really good horde tokens. It also has yeah. Watch the video where I talk about the most broken figure that's been printed in a long time. And once again, world champions have been messing with it. So it's <clears throat> yeah, um, check that video out. Show us some love. Like us. Please subscribe to us. And uh, like I said, we'll I'll try to put up a video every week. We're also going to start doing a, an idea where you take a figure that has a lot of rules questions and we will show during like a live, we'll set up a map, set up some situations, 
and explain to you the rules behind that figure and how they work with different iterations of the game. One I really want to do is Silver Centurion. Oh, God. I started to do a write-up on him, and then I realized that he's going to get errated, actually. He's going to... He's... So for now, I'm not going to do him, but once he gets his official errata, that's one I would like to do. That's a good example of somebody yeah. who has tons of rule questions. And he's one that we're going to see a lot of. Yeah, and you're going to see a lot of them, and so I want to show you on a map how different things would work out and you know the answers and the, also the thinking process of how do you come to this conclusion that you prop through him and not through the token and how come the token has the flight symbol but it can't carry like I, I will explain those things and try to educate you guys I think that'll be a cool little series oh yeah to do once a week so look be on the lookout for that but for now subscribe to our YouTube channel and that's it check us out on Twitter Facebook Instagram uh, send us an email dial h 4 hero clicks at gmail.com uh, let us know any main topics that you would like for us to talk about any questions that you have we will read on the air I've got a couple saved up for Saturday that I'm going to read you guys have submitted any ideas for just the tips and uh, like I said this week was a shorter episode due to time constraints but coming up Saturday we'll be back on the full two and a half three hour long spiels that we go on we have some ROC to test we, yeah we'll have uh, we'll have big news coming off of our ROC event and how so, badly I beat Hunter. I doubt it, but we'll see. I'm not too confident. How badly Hunter's luck beats him. <laughs> so we'll see you guys Saturday <laughs> with a new episode. Later.